All right, well, welcome back. It's wonderful to have all of you here on this beautiful Friday evening. And now we arrive at the crowning event of this two-day Watergate commemoration here at the Ford. And the event, of course, is this conversation that we've been anticipating between Richard Norton Smith and Brian Lamb. What's delightful about these two individuals is that they are not just interesting in their own capacity as individuals, but they're interesting in who they are together, their chemistry, their way of working with each other and conversing, the arguments they get in, the catalysts they are. Oh, you should have heard them at lunch. They're going at each other like an old married couple. <laughs> now, our friends of Ford know Richard well because he has adopted our community as his home. Richard is a national treasure, the very best when it comes to political history in general and to presidential history in particular. He has provided imaginative, energetic leadership at a number of institutions that are dedicated to American statesmanship, not only here at the Ford where he served for a number of years, but also at the Dole, Reagan, Eisenhower, Hoover, and Lincoln. In addition, he is a best-selling author of first-rate biographies on George Washington and Nelson Rockefeller, Colonel McCormick, and Thomas Dewey, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And speaking of biographies, Richard informs us that he just submitted to his publisher a 1,100-page manuscript that will be the definitive study of Gerald Ford. And he tells me that this book on Gerald Ford is actually shorter than his Nelson Rockefeller book, but they're about the same length as the Bible. <laughs> Richard, you've come a long way since you were an intern in the Ford White House and a student at Harvard of Doris Kearns Goodwin. Now, Brian Lamb is also well known to friends of Ford because of all the C-SPAN junkies of mine. Just give me a show of hands. Give Brian, how many C-SPAN junkies do you have in here? There you go. <laughs> Brian, like Richard, is also a national treasure, the very best when it comes to pulling back the curtain on American government and U.S. history. His leadership at C-SPAN over four decades is the closest thing we have to a national town hall. C-SPAN's cameras allow citizens to see their public servants at work, <laughs> for good or ill, without filters or mediation. Brian is also famous for his disarmingly straightforward interview style that he developed on Washington Journal, book notes, and Q&A, uh, which generated some of the most worthwhile TV available. Now, at a cocktail party, people kind of stare at you and go, really? But it, it is outstanding TV. Uh, his, his interview questions are just precious. I think my favorite, Brian, was the time you asked an author why he wrote a thousand words a day in the bathtub. <laughs> I've said to my students that they could get the equivalent of a master's degree in history just by tuning in and watching Brian's interview style with great historians and just getting the substance from those interviews. And among his numerous honors are the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the National Humanities Medal. So, the question I always ask, are you ready to learn? Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Ready to learn. Give him a warm Michigan welcome. Okay. Um, tonight we have a role reversal. Nobody ever complimented me on my interview style, <laughs> but uh, I get to ask the questions. Um, and the first is, I guess, the easiest, most obvious place to begin is where were you and what were you doing professionally in June of 1972? I was, excuse me, I have an allergy throat today. Tree pollen in Washington. It's not all that's in Washington. Um, <laughs> in June of 1972, I was working in the White House Office of Telecommunications Policy uh, in Washington for a man named Clay Whitehead. There's only one thing I need to tell you. Even though it was called the White House Office of Telecommunications Policy, it wasn't in the White House. It was down the, the uh, street of, uh, block, which is a very important part of the story, which we might get into. So you were, I mean, part of, if I'm, maybe on the periphery of the Nixon administration? I mean, were, were you, do you have a political background? No. I've never been political. I've never been a, a member of a political party. Uh, I was having the time of my life, because I had worked in the LBJ White House as a social aide when I was in the Navy, and then 
having experience in the Nixon White House, I was just observing all this, was not political, was intrigued by it, and trying to learn how the whole thing worked. Do you know, do you remember where you were when you heard about the break-in? It was, I think, it was, um, uh, Gary referred to, I mean, this is the actual uh, 50th anniversary, but my memory was I heard about it on Saturday morning after the Friday night, um, and I was in a car driving, and I thought, wow, that's weird. <laughs> it's interesting, Pat Buchanan once said to me when I asked him that, and you know Pat, he's, I mean, he's a great shooter, yep. and, he, and he said, I said, how did you find out? You know, who told you? He said, well, no one had to tell me. Uh, the minute I heard it, presumably as you heard it, I figured we were involved. <laughs> and, and I said, why? And he said, because, and I'd never known this before, he said, because we had someone, uh, a mole, in the Muskie campaign, and we were getting regular reports back from them. <laughs> and, you know, Xerox material and so on and so on. And so it was not a leap of great proportion to believe that this was perhaps an extension of the same kind of political espionage. I, I actually didn't have that reaction because I really was, I hate to keep using this word, naive about how the whole thing worked. I had lived through the other crises and the other scandals as Garrett was talking about. And so I didn't just, I just didn't go there. Uh, it sounded so ludicrous. I thought, no, this can't happen. Wrong. <laughs> what did it take to, to change your mind? I think more than anything else, living in Washington and having at the time two newspapers, uh, Garrett referred to the Washington Daily News as going down, uh, which was a fun little news, it was a tabloid. And then we had the Washington Star, which they ended in 1981. But the Post and their kind of, you know, a full field approach to the whole issue took me, because I love newspapers and I would always go to the stories on it. And it got to the point before long, and this is gonna sound weird to some of you, is that every single night I would drive down to the corner of 16th and K when the post would come out on that corner there at 1020 and I would get the post for the next day. We didn't have internet or any of that stuff so you had to get it because I knew that my future was at stake. The future of the country could be at stake. It was fascinating. Clearly the Nixon White House uh, sought to minimize the significance of all of this, and obviously distance itself from, from the event. Um, at the same time, they went after the Post, uh, I mean, suggesting that the, at the very least, the Post was uh, um, exaggerating the importance of this. I mean, did you have that, I mean, you were going to meet the paper every night, so you obviously were uh, hooked, in a sense. Well, <clears throat> as an outsider, of the White House, even though we had that title. Uh, we had relationships inside the White House with people. They were suspicious of us from the very beginning as an institution, we're a tiny little place. We had 60 people, there was a $9 million a year budget. And my boss, who is to this day one of my big heroes, Clay Whitehead, who was first of all, and first and foremost, honest. And he wanted to change communications in this country to where it is now. He wanted this multiplicity of voices. It had nothing to do with what Chuck Colson was trying to do in the White House, or Bob Haldeman wasn't involved in that part of it, but it was mostly Colson leading it. Herb Klein was the communications director in the White House, and he was always in the White House trying to protect the broadcasting business. So it was a very complicated situation. And my boss, who I learned a tremendous amount, by the way, C-SPAN would not be here today without Watergate, without my boss, without the satellite uh, communications, and it all came out of that period. Had you had any contact with Richard Nixon? I had none. The first time I met Richard Nixon was in the late 80s, early 90s, I can't remember the exact date, when he came in to do a two-hour conversation for Book Notes, which was a program that I used to host. And the funny thing about it, just as a quick aside, 
I purposely had left the name Nixon out of my resume because I had, when I left the Nixon administration, I had an ABC guy on the street one day who I knew said, you know you're gonna have to cleanse yourself now that you've worked for the Nixon administration. I was mad as heck because he had said that. But I left my connection with Nixon out and when he came in for the interview, he started telling me everything that I had done in my life. He had no idea that I had ever worked in his administration. Really? Yeah. I, was, I mean, I just kept thinking, this is interesting. Somebody handed him a bio, he read it, and he said, yeah, you worked at UPI, and you did this, and oh, yeah. As you mentioned, I have to ask, it's out of sequence, but it doesn't matter. Um, did anything about that encounter you had with Richard Nixon, which I think led to, what, two broadcasts? Yeah, two one hours, yeah. Two one, okay, two hours you spent with him. Did anything uh, surprise you? Yeah, it did. I looked at that face sitting in front of me and said, oh my God, that's Richard Nixon in front of me. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not kidding because you, I only had seen him on television and his, you know, he's a large, he's not a large man, but he had a just unusual looking face. He was very friendly when he came in and we actually didn't talk about Watergate in the interview. Uh, we talked, talked about world affairs. And the reason I didn't was because everybody talked to him about Watergate and I thought, let's try to do something different. But yeah, I remember that. Also, I remember small things. He had jettisoned his Secret Service protection, and the guy that was with him was the sheriff of Upper uh, Saddle River, New Jersey. He was his only protection. And he came in in the morning to do the first hour, and then he went to the hotel, <clears throat> had his cottage cheese and, and uh, ketchup or whatever he ate at lunch, and changed his shirt, took a nap, changed his shirt, changed his tie, and came back in and did the second hour. And, and how did your colleagues at C-SPAN react to, uh, to having Richard Nixon in their midst? One guy refused to leave his office. Um, that, that was interesting because he's very, he was very political, and we aren't political. And uh, it, was, it always rubbed people the wrong way when they did that. However, we never made a big thing out of any guests coming in. And when the interview was over in the afternoon, I walked out of the studio with the president, and the entire hallway was lined up with people. And the, our building has lots of different offices in it. We got out in the lobby, there was a huge crowd there. Went outside, and there was a huge crowd. It was the biggest crowd we ever had, and everybody was just saying, why are they all here? But he, his name uh, was so enormous, and so and his impact was so great that people just wanted to see him. The second biggest guest we ever had was Hillary Clinton. Really? Yeah. I mean, the crowd that came out. And, and of course, there is a connection between the two, isn't there? Yeah, well, she worked for the Watergate Committee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to know her thoughts on the, <laughs> on the, on the 50th anniversary. Um, you, was there a moment when it sort of dawned, I mean, a, a light bulb went off, that, that this is over? I mean, and the reason I ask it is because the kind of the conventional narrative is it really took until the quote smoking gun tape was released, um, you know, uh, a few days, literally that at the beginning of the week when when uh, when Nixon left, uh, the Supreme Court had ruled about ten days earlier that he had to turn over the tapes, um, and I have been told. Um, uh, he was out in San Clemente, and there were multiple calls placed, um, one from Al Haig, um, and um, the, the basic the question was, can we get away with defying the Supreme Court? And the political people in the White House, people like Bill Timmons and others, um, Judge Bork, uh, Supreme Court fame, uh, also told me he got a call and um, they made it crystal clear that it was over and if they attempted to defy the court, um, they were, you know, they were hastening their demise. What was that period like? Well, for me, it was over for me when the tapes uh, the transcripts came out from the tapes. Um, I sat down and read that and I said, I can't believe the President of the United States and his aides and people like Billy Graham are talking like this in the Oval Office. 
And I'm not a moralist, so I just said I'm, I'm leaving. I can't but, do but this. The, we're talking I, about I not, not the, the final tapes, but no, the... No, the, the early tapes. But that was in uh, uh, back in April, near April of 74. Uh, <clears throat> You'll think we had this arranged, but I have a, a piece of paper here that I brought with me. I've never, just, I don't want to be dramatic, but I've never read it to anybody. I've never... Uh, but I would. The only reason I bring it up is because I'm just going to read just a little bit of it to you. To, you ask the question, so you're going to get this answer. Yep. This is dated August 6, 1974, and as you know, we were involved in this secret transition to, between you know the doing working for Grand Rapids' his own Phil Buchan. Um, and behind the scenes, which we can talk about. But I, I wrote this down. I was all by myself. I was not married. I lived in an apartment. And here's what I said. I just I said, I'm going to write this down for history purposes. I've never told anybody I did it. Uh, it says that approximately 10.30 PM, Clay White had called me from his sister's house in Virginia to ask if I could get together with him this evening to discuss a matter of confidence. I invited him to stop by the apartment. He arrived at about 11 p.m., at which time he told me that we had to begin final plans for the vice president to take over the presidency from Richard Nixon, who planned to resign possibly as early as Friday, August the 9th. This note is on August the 6th. Now, this is a probably, as Jack Hushin would tell you, probably a little bit of hyperbole that I wrote. <clears throat> I said, uh, we discussed contingency plans for about an hour, and then I took him home, to home at that time. I don't know why he didn't have a car. Uh, the following people were aware of President Nixon's plans to resignation. Al Haig, Vice President Ford, Phil Buchan, Clay White, and me. Uh, we agreed to continue our discussions Thursday morning. So it was at that time that I knew absolutely this was over, which was probably I'm sure others probably knew it, but it was probably a day ahead of most people. Uh, okay, let's back up from this. How did this, in effect, secret, certainly secretive, uh, transition committee come into being? Um, when? And did Gerald Ford know anything about it? Never know about Gerald Ford, because as far as we were concerned, he never knew anything about it. <clears throat> Phil Buchan was his best friend from here, a lawyer. I'm sure some of you probably knew the family or still do. Uh, after Vice President Ford became Vice President, <clears throat> he called Phil Buchan and said, I need you in Washington. Come, be, be there, be my eyes and ears around town. Nobody will know you. It'll be a chance for you just to kind of uh, be by my side. So he had to find a place to put him, and they didn't want him in the White House or in the old executive office building. So. I don't quite know how this happened, but we ended up in our little office down the street to have an office for Phil Buchan, who, by the way, is one of the nicest human beings I've ever met. Uh, and Tom cooked up, and this is exactly what he did, a, something called a privacy commission, and they made Phil Buchan head of it. It wasn't confirmed by the Senate or any of that stuff. It was a place for him to go. And Tom Whitehead at the time was in his 30s. Brilliant MIT graduate, PhD, master's degree. Uh, honest is the day is long. And uh, he and Phil Buchan, who was not quite a bit older, but older, uh, had a friendship built out of just being around each other. Tom believed in governing. Phil Buchan had never governed. And Tom started talking to Phil about, listen, this guy's going to be president someday. So he better be ready, and you're by his side, and you better be ready, because this is a tough town. And that's how it started. And Tom said to Phil Buchan, I'm going to start a group of people sitting around talking about the presidency and what decisions your guy has, is going to have to make once he becomes president. So we start. I mean, Tom called me. I was out of government. He called me and he said, I want you to work on this transition, the secret transition group, and you can't talk about it with anybody. Number one, I didn't want to do this. I needed to work because uh, I was out for the first time without a job and I needed to work. But Tom had done so much for me, I said, I'll do it. 
And he called two of his friends, and most of you in this room never heard of him, a guy named Larry Lynn, who I think is still alive. I think he was at the Interior Department. I think so, too. <clears throat> yeah. And um, Jonathan Moore, who had worked for uh, Elliot uh, Richardson and, um, and others, but was a very schooled man about government. And we met in Tom Whitehead's uh, dining room in the basement of his home in Georgetown. And we would do it once a week. And we'd sit around for a couple of hours. I was not a policy expert under any circumstances. But Tom wanted me there because of my media and congressional relations. It's hard to imagine um, a more amorphous uh, task confronting you. First of all, I mean, frankly, your claims to legitimacy were tenuous. Absolutely. Um, so are. <laughs> they, they, they depended on the vice president being able, as he was able to do on more than one occasion, to publicly deny that anyone on his staff was in any way preparing for a transition, uh, which, again, was a prerequisite for his, his uniquely uncomfortable position. Um, you, you weren't in the policy shaping business. So what were the kinds of things um, that you were able to discuss? Was well, it personnel? Everything you can imagine. And Tom Whitehead, his full name's Clay T. Whitehead. Tom Whitehead had worked on the transition from the Johnson administration to the Nixon administration. And so, but he's a government interested guy, and, and, and I wasn't particularly. Uh, I was interested in the media, uh, and I was having this experience and learning a lot about how the whole thing worked. Um, and, but the other two guys were really policy types, and they, loved, they were also uh, good government people. So they wanted, I mean, at this time, we were so unbelievably fatigued about being in the Nixon administration. The town was fatigued. The anger was there. The tension was there. Um, and it was just got getting worse and worse. And I should tell you that before I got out of government in April of 1974, that for about a six-month period, you could get no decisions made out of the White House. The government was stopped. That doesn't mean that no decisions were made, but if you had something you wanted to get them to approve, uh, it just it took just forever. I, we had a report on cable television that was going to be released, and it took six months to get it out. And after that, I got out. I said, this, I can't do this anymore. <clears throat> and um, the, the idea was that to think through everything that a president would have to think through on day one. None of us were going to work for him. Tom Whitehead was going to get out after this happened. These other two guys were, uh, had no interest in working in the Ford administration. It was just a service, frankly, in the end, to Phil Buchan. Uh, those of you who have never met Phil Buchan, I mean, he's no, deceased. Uh, he's just a fabulous human being, and everybody admired him. And you can't take that out of this picture, because if the guy had been a jerk or whatever it was, Tom wouldn't have paid any attention to him. But Tom loved the planning part of governing. Uh, that raised the question, did Phil Buchan participate in these meetings? Never. No. Never. So he, in effect, set it in motion, but then kept his distance. Absolutely. Never. And well, in the end, we prepared this huge loose leaf notebook and a 16-page report and all this stuff and gave it. And Tom met with Phil. I didn't meet with Phil. Um, and talked it through what they had had there. But Tom gave him some advice. Uh, I'm laughing because Jack Hushin, who's an old old friend of mine, I haven't seen each other for 50 years, uh, we were press secretaries together on Capitol Hill. And he was the Justice Department and came over to the Ford administration. He knows everything we're talking about here uh, and, and, uh, and the complicated nature of it. Um, that Tom said that this is the best advice he ever gave Phil Buchan. He said, when this happens, get into the limousine, ride to Alexandria to Jerry Ford's house, and hand this to him. If you ask anybody else to do that, it'll never get there. And because we learned subsequent to all this, there were about three of these secret transition groups around town, all wanting to get this president's attention. Frankly, 
some of them were Michiganders and people were protecting for it. Others wanted to say, I want to get into that. I want to get into that White House and I want to have some of my own special power. Did you make a suggestion regarding, speaking of press secretaries, um, the press operation? Being someone interested in media yourself, was that something that, uh, that you advised your fellow panelists on? Only thing I did that had any thing positive in the whole situation, because again, I listened more than I said anything. I recommended, and it's on paper, I found it in Tom Whitted's, uh, he's got a website and I found it getting ready for this, because, but I wasn't the only guy that did this, but I said, if it were me, I would recommend a Jerry Terhorst to be Jerry Ford's press secretary. He's from Grand Rapids, he worked at the Detroit News, he was very much respected in town. He had a lot of maturity about him. I knew him, but didn't know him very well. It wasn't a well thought out thing, but uh, I had worked around Ron Ziegler, uh, who was not particularly respected by anybody, uh, and, uh, and was paranoid, just like his boss. Uh, and uh, so, um, uh, I, I th Jerry Torres was liked by the press, and at least they'd get that monkey uh, off any uh, future president's back because one of the reasons that uh, the press went after Richard Nixon is because he hated them and they hated him. Doesn't work. What became of your recommendations? Well, an awful lot of them, yeah. What be here's the problem. What became of it all was that everybody crashed into the White House the day of the resignation all with her hands up, let me do it, let me do it. Does that include Donald Rumsfeld? <clears throat> and Dick Cheney. Uh, Dick Cheney was at least pleasant to us. Uh, but <laughs> Tom and I, Tom says, come with me. We're going to the White House. We're going to go to the old executive office building. When the president's giving his speech and leaving on the helicopter, we're going to be here because Don Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney are going to show up. And, and Don Rumsfeld was going to become the uh, chief of staff for a while, and then Dick Cheney became chief of staff, and Don Rumsfeld went to the Pentagon. Well, we're standing there, and I, I, I hate to tell you this. It's going to sound uh, casual. I wanted this to be over. And I'm standing there, and Tom's got all this stuff. All, and he worked very hard on this. And Don Rumsfeld came in, and he had flown overnight from NATO, because he was ambassador to NATO. And he, he walked into this room, and Tom said, I have for you the material that we've collected for the transition. My memory isn't perfect, but he did everything but throw the book down on the table and brush us off and keep on walking, which to me was rather deflating. Uh, not for me, but for Tom, because he really was very sincere about this. Tom didn't give up. Uh, he knew what was going to happen. I did. I said, I'm gone. Tom didn't give up. And he continued to meet in the White House in some of these planning meetings uh, for the next month or so. But uh, it was a tough situation. Is it fair to say that uh, overall, in retrospect, that Whitehead found it a frustrating experience? Yeah, if you knew Tom Whitehead, you'll never know. Um, he was one of these guys that uh, had never said much. He just, people would come into the office all the time to lobby him, and he'd just sit there. I mean, I knew him very well. We were close friends after, uh, we close friends. he died about 14 years ago, and we were close friends till his death. Um, and he'd drive people crazy because he wouldn't react. They'd come in and say, the world's coming to an end. If you don't do this, you don't do that, or we're going to go out of business. And Tom, mm. <laughs> and the guy that ended up, I should tell you, by the way, that Tom White is general counsel for the first 18, years, 18 months that I was there was Nino Scalia. And um, <clears throat> we were always working between our office and the White House to convince the White House that when we proposed something, it was worthy. So the White House would test us all the time, different people, not the White House. There's no such thing as the White House. But the, the individuals would test us all the time as to whether or not we were worthy of their attention. And one of my favorite moments was Chuck Colson, who, as you remember, he said he'd walk over to his grandmother for Richard Nixon. 
uh, and I believe he would. Uh, but I was the guy that had to work with Chuck Colson, and um, I liked him. He was nice enough to me and all that stuff, but he was, <laughs> when you would call to his office, he was always on the phone with the president. And I am positive that his secretary was told to say that when anybody called him. <laughs> and, and she actually was from my home uh, state of Indiana, and I'd say, Holly, can I talk to Chuck? And she said, oh, Brian, I'll get it. He'll get back to you. He's on the phone with the president. You know, I thought, yeah, this is getting really tiresome. But one day, she called up and said he wants to see you, Colson. So uh, he wasn't my boss, but he obviously was in the White House. And I went over to see him. And this is the kind of thing that you never see. Um, he said the president was having, um, uh, I don't know if I don't know if it was a fundraiser or not, out at San Clemente last night, and this was, I don't remember the time, is 72 or so, you know, I think it was before Watergate. And John Gavin, the actor, uh, was coming through the receiving line, and he was the president of the Screen Actors Guild. And when John Gavin got to the president, he said, uh, Mr. President, we've, you've got to help us do something. Now, this is going to surprise you. You've got to help us to do something about these reruns on television. <laughs> What you can't remember, I'm sure, is that they used to have 39 weeks of original programs on these networks, the three networks, every year. Well, they had shrunk those to 24. The networks had figured out that they could repeat them. And Gavin wanted the President of the United States to somehow or another engineer it so this, the networks had to run 39 originals a year. So Colson calls and has me come over, and I can remember sitting in his office, says, you guys have to do something about this. <laughs> well, it's illegal, and, uh, <clears throat> and no, you got to do something about it. Get, get a plan back to me. So I went back to the office, and I said, we got a problem on our hands, and um, Tom called Nino uh, Scalia, as he was. He wasn't a judge, and I can call him Nino at that point called him to the office and, and, the, and his assistant general counsel, and he said, we got a problem. And I said, well, here's what Chuck wants us to do. He wants us to stretch these reruns out, you know, to, mean, to, to reduce the reruns and stretch it out. And Nino said, that would be illegal. And he was our general counsel. So here's what's wrong with a lot of government. What, we had to do something. You know, we had to do something. It's just kind of like the debates you hear every day. Do something. So we cooked up this ridiculous idea that Tom would do a study, a study on reruns. <laughs> now, now, the advantage to me was that I had to travel with him all over the country to do the study on reruns. So we went to the headquarters of CBS, your beloved CBS, and NBC, and then we went out and saw all the people that do the movies out in Hollywood and all this stuff. It was a great education, and we came up with a study. And the, but the only thing that really mattered in this is that the president could announce he's doing a study, which was a message to the Screen Actors Guild and John Gavin that he was paying attention to things. So, um, you know, the, we were in an odd relationship the whole time with the, the White House. I want to, uh, as you know, because you've read most of it, um, the book offers uh, a portrait of Gerald Ford that I think many people will find surprising. Um, and you illustrate that wonderfully in a story uh, about lobbying for a candidate for a position on the FCC and how good old Jerry uh, responded. Could you share that? Yeah. Uh, some of you may have heard of Jim Quello, um, a uh, Michigander, used to run, I think, WJR in, in Detroit. And uh, Quello was, when Jerry Ford was the minority leader, was his candidate for the Republican seat on the FCC. Although Quello was a Democrat. Well, I was a Democrat, yes, no. but it didn't matter. I mean, you know, he wasn't really a Democrat, but I mean, at the time. <laughs> uh, so we had our own candidate.
and a guy that we thought was eminently qualified to be on the FCC, Syria. I mean, you got, you got to know that Tom White was serious about this, and it wasn't a political thing. He wanted somebody that was, you know, schooled in all this regulation and all that stuff. And so we, we kept getting in the way. We kept working at the White House saying, you, you know, we got our candidate, you know, Jim Quello isn't qualified, and all this kind of stuff. Well, as time went by, Jerry Ford was getting more and more irritated uh, because his candidate wasn't getting approved. So a fabulous human being named Max Friedersdorf, who was a White House lobbyist, but from my great state of Indiana, uh, and I knew him, and he was a delightful man, called me up one day. I can still remember it. And I, you know, Max called, and he said, Brian, I have a message from Gerald Ford to you about the Jim Quello seat on the FCC. You either get out of the way or we're going to zero your appropriations, which meant that we would be out of business. <laughs> and if a Republican had done that on the House floor and said no more money for OTP is what we were called, it would have probably happened. So we got out of the way. Uh, did Ford ever mention that to you later? Yeah. I didn't. I mean, I knew him, but no, not, not well at all. I'd interviewed him a couple of times. Matter of fact, the last time I think I interviewed him was at the Waldorf Astoria. We did an hour interview with him up there. He was delightful. Delightful. That was after he was president. Um, just to wrap up, to return to the obviously the, the main topic of the evening. Fifty years have gone by, and uh, it's a very different republic. Um, although, uh, again, we can find parallels between then and now. Um, are you satisfied? that we know everything we should know about the overly broadly labeled Watergate scandal? Well, with Garrett's book, what more is there to say? <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is going to sound shallow on my part. Most things I do probably sound shallow. But I watch every documentary that's on Watergate. I'm not overwhelmed by the need to know everything. I read books on the whole thing. And it was just recently, you're going to laugh at me, Garrett, when I say this. It's just recently that I heard clearly what the problem was with Richard Nixon, in my opinion, not anybody else's necessarily. And I should have come to this conclusion a long time ago. And I think this is really, in my opinion, the reason why he was so awful and so good at times, all sides of this, is that he was paranoid. And it just has come through to me time and time again. You actually said it earlier. He was paranoid of everything and everybody. Did he have a right to be paranoid? No. He had a right to be skeptical. He had a right to not trust everybody, but he didn't have a right to be paranoid. And when he, I, I, I don't know, Jack, I'd love to hear your take on it. Uh, when he attacked the press, and this is the days of communism, which I think everybody misses. And the people, the young people, they have no idea what it was like to live in a world where communism was a fundamental political uh, issue at all times, uh, especially out in his races in, in California. But when he attacked the press and then got into the White House and hated the press, they continued to hate him. And uh, as that hate builds, and it's the same thing with Donald Trump, you cannot, you think you can attack the press, call them nasty names and all that stuff, and you might win a little bit, but in the end, uh, it's, it doesn't work. You don't have to love them, <clears throat> but uh, the hate thing and the paranoia that he had is what I think in the end brought him down. I have to ask you, it just occurs to me, in the aftermath of Watergate, and the profound change of mood, as Garrett talked about, uh, that took hold and seems to have taken hold. Um, did any of that factor into your efforts to create the network that became C-SPAN? It was dominant. I mean, it started for me when I was in the Pentagon working in the Navy and in the press office. Um, and the big reason that I wanted to get involved in this, and I did not do this by myself, I had a tremendous amount of support from a lot of industry people that 
thought it was a good idea at the time. <clears throat> and without them, it wouldn't happen, period. Um, but three networks doing exactly the same thing every night at exactly the same time <clears throat> was, as it seemed to me in a rich country like this, a bad idea. <clears throat> That's what was driving me. And then when I learned what I learned from uh, Tom Whitehead uh, about how this could change with satellites and cable, and now you see what it is. There's so much out there you can't see it all. That, that was the driving force, that we needed more rather than less. And I know you hate to hear that because this guy would like to go back to the 1920s. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never could uh, program my VCR, so. Uh, <laughs> OK, maybe we've got a few minutes for questions, uh, if anyone has one. Yeah, yes. Uh, William Milliken was the governor of Michigan in 72, and he was invited to, to, to talk to John Ehrlichman. I went with him because I was on the staff, and Governor Milliken had a private meeting with Ehrlichman two days before Watergate break-in. Oddly enough, we were both staying in the Watergate Hotel as an accommodation, but Ehrlichman was campaigning or organized a campaign to get Governor Milliken as a surrogate and said, everything is good. We would appreciate your help. And what has bothered me all these years is, did Ehrlichman know about the break-in when my governor was meeting with him? Here. <laughs> the short answer is probably not. Um, and we, we were sort of talking about this at our dinner beforehand. There, there's uh, one of the sort of remaining mysteries of Watergate is we don't actually know fully who ordered the burglary and what the burglars were actually doing that night. Um, and that we, wa we sort of shorthand the burglary as a wiretapping and they were bugging the office. Um, that's partially true. Um, the uh, uh, what many people don't realize is that it was actually the second Watergate burglary, um, and that they were actually going in to fix the problems with the bugs and the wiretaps that they had installed the first time a couple of weeks earlier. But they were also going in to look for dirt. Um, and what we don't know is whether they were looking for dirt that the Democrats had on Richard Nixon, basically what were the opposition research files that the Democrats might use on Nixon, or they were looking for information about the dirty tricks that they thought the Democrats were trying to plan on, uh, on Nixon that summer. Um, and that there are a number of different theories about what the dirt is, um, some of which relate to the, uh, so the Chenault affair was not the only criminal conspiracy in the midst of the 68 campaign. Uh, Nixon also took illegal money from the Greek military junta um, to support his campaign. Again, information that the Democrats knew that, uh, about and that he was worried might come out in the 72 campaign again. Um, uh, there are some more, uh, uh, there, there are some more theories about um, a call girl ring that might have been part of the, uh, that might have been in use at the, at the DNC um, that they, the burglars were looking for. Uh, there are some very interesting and I think not altogether crazy theories about uh, whether the CIA w actually knew about the burglary in advance and was trying to sabotage the burglary that night, um, much of which ends up tracing back to this question of who knew about it in advance. Um, and what we know is that Jeb Stuart Magruder, the deputy director of the campaign, gave G. Gordon Liddy the order to burglarize the Watergate. What we don't know is who told Magruder to order the burglary. 
and uh, that we don't know uh, the, the sort of conventional history is that it was John Mitchell um, and that Mitchell did it without the knowledge of, for instance, an Ehrlichman or a Halderman. Um, there was actually, there's a brand new piece in the Washington Post today from Jim Robineau, uh, who's another historian, pointing to new audio tapes that he's found in Halderman's uh, audio diaries saying that Mitchell said that he approved uh, the project, is the quote that Halderman uses, which might have been sort of the overall dirty tricks operation. It might have been the burglary itself. Um, but sort of part of what is so funny about it is uh, everyone thought that the burglary was a bad idea. I mean, Richard Nixon sort of first uh, reaction upon hearing about the burglary uh, on uh, that weekend uh, was, why on earth would anyone try to burglarize the DNC? Of course there's no useful information at the DNC. <laughs> so there's, uh, uh, I think you can rest easy knowing that uh, the uh, Ehrlichman probably didn't know about the burglary when he was trying to uh, get the governor involved in his campaign. Now you understand the basis of my question. But can you imagine the aftermath where the governor, who is now a surrogate for Nixon, had to explain why he was at the Watergate? <laughs> Hello. Uh, Gary, I'm going to put you on the spot. Fifty years on, people are always asking me, tell me an overrated and an underrated president. So let's apply that to Watergate. Who, who in the Watergate and the, the extended drama, as you have outlined it, much more than the, the break-in and its immediate aftermath. Uh, who, 50 years on, would you say is the most overrated figure in the Watergate saga, and who's the most underrated? Um, uh, so you, you could almost do that in sort of every slice of the Watergate story. Um, and, and I will answer it um, in... Uh, uh, in actually the context of the media, because we were sort of talking about our, our, uh, all the president's men. Um, uh, to me, one of the most interesting things that I came to understand was Woodward and Bernstein matter, but not in the way that we normally think that they do. Um, and that actually the press that carry forward the, the story from June of 72 through March of 73 which is when Watergate really sort of reaches what you might consider sort of escape velocity and has some momentum to carry it forward on its own. Uh, there was a constellation of about a half dozen reporters who uh, are all share, I think, pride of place in carrying that story forward. Um, and that arguably, actually, uh, Woodward and Bernstein don't get any of the three biggest stories that move Watergate forward from June to March. Uh, and that it's actually, uh, the, the, the story's mostly over in the summer of, uh, by July of 72. Woodward uh, goes off on vacation back to Michigan. Um, he, he, his father uh, tells him uh, sort of spends the family vacation trying to lobby uh, Woodward to vote for Richard Nixon for re-election. Um, Bernstein gets reassigned back to the Virginia desk where he had been working. Uh, and then it's actually Walter Ruggerber at the New York Times who does the first big story in July of 72 that links the burglars to the financing of the Nixon campaign. And this, the, at the New York Times, this story so embarrasses the Washington Post that they actually bring back Woodward and Bernstein together for the first time as a team and reassign them to the story. In, uh, July, in uh, September and October then, it's actually Jack Nelson and Ron Ostro at the Los Angeles Times. And this to me is actually, I think, sort of my like biggest underrated uh, moment in, in Watergate. They find Al Baldwin, who's the lookout across the street at the Howard Johnson Hotel, who sort of misses the, uh, the police pulling up and, and uh, is sort of the person who the whole thing goes wrong on. Uh, 
The FBI finds uh, Al Baldwin almost immediately. He's actually a former FBI agent himself and had spent sort of much of his time in the lookout roost calling his mother back in Connecticut. So the FBI takes about a day and a half to find Al Baldwin, and he sort of immediately sings to them the whole story. He remains secret, though, until Jack Nelson and Ron Ostro at the LA Times find him and get him to tell them his first person of what the burglary was like, what the burglary team was like. That runs in early October and is the first thing that sort of electrifies the nation about what the event is. And then it's Seymour Hirsch at the New York Times who breaks the news in January that the burglars are receiving hush money payments um, that sort of unravels beginning the cover up, uh, you know, spreads panic inside the White House, spreads panic uh, with James McCord who ends up turning uh, on his fellow burglars, et cetera, et cetera. But to me, sort of giving those reporters pride of place in the Woodward and Bernstein story, I think is, is, is the sort of most overrated and underrated. And by the way, I think actually uh, uh, Deep Throat ends up sort of one of the most overrated figures in, um, in, in this. Um, and, and there's very little convincing evidence that Deep Throat actually matters at all in the grand scheme of sort of pushing Watergate forward. Um, and, and that he's sort of mostly a literary device that Woodward and Bernstein use in All the President's Men that turns into this sort of heroic narrative. Oh, so, <clears throat> Garrett uh, mentioned the LA Times. Jack Nelson was, uh, I considered him a friend when he was the head of the LA Times uh, Bureau, and he was furious that he didn't get the kind of credit and the LA Times didn't get the kind of credit because they were very much involved in this story, and it just... It's typical story of American media. Once the story is there, everybody follows the same story. They're afraid, I mean, that's what your book did, it broke out of that. And it's, it's really kind of a tragedy of media. It, and I watched it during the, there are all these documentaries going on right now about Watergate, they're all, they're all talking to the same people. Different networks talking to the same people. Uh, the, strangest one of all of them right now is something called Gaslit. If anybody's seen that, it's Martha Mitchell and uh, John Mitchell, and it's strange uh, that Martha Mitchell's played by Julia Roberts, and of all things, John Mitchell's played by Sean Penn, and you cannot tell it when you see it. It's crazy. Uh, it's, it's, it's exaggerated, but the biggest problem with this story is it's always the same, and uh, the same people get credit for everything, and it's not... You know, I don't want to take anything away from the Woodward and Bernstein story, but it's complicated. A lot of people involved. Time for one more question. <clears throat> Back there. <clears throat> I want to know more about this secret committee. Um, can you take us in the room a little bit? What was it like when you were having those meetings? Were these whiskey-soaked meetings? Were these serious? Was it, uh, you know, people sitting around smoking stogies and joking around about what might happen? Or was it dead serious and you took it as a, it was, it was a job? I have two whole pages describing exactly that in my book. If you wait till April, you can, uh, you can <laughs> I can answer all of your questions. But in the meantime, you were there. I'm going to, what? matter of fact, is I'm going to change the story that I gave him. So this is a chat. <laughs> it was very serious. Uh, <clears throat> these were not jokesters in any way. There was no booze. There was no food. There was no anything. As a matter of fact, Tom Whitehead's wife is a close friend of mine, and uh, she was always upstairs. Uh, she's very smart and got a PhD, and I'm sure she wanted to be in those meetings, but she knew a lot, I'm sure, because of, she, she could get this stuff out of Tom. There was, it was not, this was a deadly serious problem for this country. I'm not a flag waver. I just, you know, I'm an American. I live it and uh, believe in it and all that. But, and people in the room just, they thought this was their responsibility. It didn't cost us anything to spend that time down there. It was, and it was interesting. For me, it was very interesting because these guys were smart, a lot smarter than I am. Uh, and that was all, you know, when you're around people that are smarter than you, are, you, st you tend to learn something. So I took it as a chance to learn, but there was no funny stuff going on at all. And, and let it be recorded that Tom Whitehead's 
wife uh, was the person who dubbed the committee the Ford Foundation. <laughs> she had a point. Uh, Richard, can I actually ask you, uh, uh, as you're finishing up this amazing Ford biography, um, give us sort of a little bit of a sense of Gerald Ford's thought evolution as he watches Watergate play out. Because I, 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 I have sort of always found Ford such a fascinating figure in this and sort of the transition, of course, of, you know, in less than a year to be the only person in America never elected to the vice presidency or the presidency to hold both of those offices. And I, I wonder sort of if you could talk about what you learned uh, as Ford goes from minority leader in the burglary to president in, in August of 74 which I understand is probably like 19 of the chapters of your book, but <laughs> give, give us the four-minute version of the entire yeah, last third exactly. of your book. <laughs> well, first of all, Gerald Ford was a man who could keep secrets, which surprises people because he is quite understandably and rightfully um, remembered as the most open, uh, you know, in his attitudes about government and, and the like. Um, and I am utterly convinced that he went to his grave with a, a number of undisclosed uh, secrets. Um, not, I hasten to add, anything scandalous, but, um, well, he, first of all, never expected to be vice president. Um, he had concluded that he was not going to be, he was never going to be speaker. And so even before the 74 election, he'd made a pact with Mrs. Ford. Basically, look, we've done this for 25 years. I'm not going to reach my goal, for which I spent all those nights on the road, um, 200 or more a year, um, campaigning in the hopes of becoming speaker. So that's, you know, and the kids were just, you know, college age. Um, he wanted to spend more time with them. Uh, and he thought, okay, um, if we don't win X number of seats in 72, the Nixon landslide, well, one secret, what people don't know, um, is Ford had a handshake deal with 17 Democratic members of Congress, mostly Southern conservatives, who told him that if the Republicans got within spitting distance of a majority in the House on election night, 1972, that they were prepared to switch parties and make him speaker. So, um, in fact, in the end, he, he only picked up, the Republicans picked up five seats that night. Um, so, so much for that. So anyway, so he decided, okay. So when the vice presidency came along and, and I don't want to give away. <laughs> I don't want to give away too many headlines. Uh, but, go ahead. But give it away, let, let's let's just say that he was not surprised um, when it was revealed that Spiro Agnew had serious legal problems. When the vice presidency came along, um, um, he was very careful. He was very cautious. Um, he certainly didn't want to look like he was running for it, but you know, signals were sent back and forth. And the fact of the matter is, it, he thought this was a nice way to retire. Two years, as, as Steve Ford told his mother, don't worry, vice presidents don't do anything. <laughs> and, um, and then at the, at the end of the two years, he could cut a, a, create a new life, where basically he would be a lawyer lobbyist and spend half his time in D.C. and the rest in Michigan, make a little bit of money for the first time, because he had no money. Um, you gotta remember about, about the Ford family. And that was gonna be the plan. Um, and so he was, you know, kind of thrilled when the vice presidency came along. Mrs. Ford, mm, you know, as long as you promise after two years, you know, as long as we're out of here, in 75, okay. He quickly decided that it was the worst job he ever had. He told Dick Cheney it was the worst job he ever had. 
Um, I don't know if that was supposed to be consoling to Dick Cheney, um, <laughs> who probably had his own reasons from time to time to reach that conclusion on his own. Um, it was an impossible job, absolutely impossible. He started out believing Nixon. He, he couldn't believe... Gerald Ford, to some people, will seem naive. Um, but if you know West Michigan, and if you know this town, and if you know the Ford family, it, it doesn't seem naive. It seems perfectly natural. He believed that people told him the truth. He always told the truth, and he just assumed that other people told the truth to him. He literally found it impossible to believe that, and remember, Dick Nixon had been his friend for 25 years. Um, good friend, close friend. I mean, as close as you get in politics at that level. Uh, he, he really couldn't believe that Nixon would lie to him. And it took, uh, uh, it took months to, um, in effect, unravel that conviction. Um, and in the meantime, as I said, it was an impossible position. Um, the Republicans, rank and file, members of Congress, his old colleagues, they were all coming to him because God knows they didn't want Nixon campaigning for them. I mean, the only person that, A, could, you know, successfully campaign, raise funds, et cetera, et cetera, for Republicans was the vice president. But the White House saw Ford as their best insurance, to be perfectly honest with you. It, there were people in the White House who thought Ford was their best insurance because they had a very cynical view about Ford's abilities, and they believed that Congress would never vote to impeach or remove the president if it meant replacing him with Gerald Ford. That was only the most egregious of the ways in which they misjudged the mood of Congress um, and, and ultimately the country. But the, the White House counted on Ford to be out there day after day after day defending the president. His colleagues in Congress expected Ford to be out there day after day after day protecting their seats. It was an impossible situation. And over time, um, you know, and remember, he's only vice president for, what, nine months? Certainly by the spring of 1974, well, one day Nixon said to him, hey, I have these transcripts, you know, that will prove my innocence. You want to see them? And Ford very shrewdly said no. Um, he, he did not want to get into that swamp. And, and he didn't. And the remarkable thing is, that, so that in a sense the strategy worked. As, as awful as it was to live through it, as unpleasant as it was to be disillusioned in the way that he was, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The fact is, there was a remarkable bipartisan consensus in August of 1974 that this guy was a legitimate president who had the character uh, and the honesty to begin to restore public trust. And that's because he zigzagged for nine months as vice president. If you, if you go back and read the clippings at the time, there was criticism because he was inconsistent. Well, of course he was inconsistent. He was inconsistent because he was one day after another, um, you know, adhering to a different mission. But it all sort of pointed to the same. The, the, the larger question that is almost unanswerable is when did he really know that it was over? He privately insisted that it was when the Supreme Court ruled, I think on the 24th of July, that Nixon had to give up the tapes. Um, which, when you stop to think about it, is amazingly late in the day. Basically, in two weeks. But <laughs> Mrs. Ford said, you know, everyone else has four months to prepare for a presidency. We had 24 hours. And the fact is, until the night before Nixon quit, Ford could not say anything. Mrs. Ford could not say anything. No one on their staff. They had a, an unofficial, official understanding. They didn't discuss it in the office. Uh, even the people closest to Ford 
nobody could allude to the slightest possibility that there might be a change in the Oval Office, which meant none of the routine business of a presidential transition could begin, which also means why, it helps to explain why there was a secret, improbable committee of people because Phil Buchan um, had, a, had a brainstorm. It's, it's a remarkable story, and like the remarkable story that, that you tell, um, we, lots of us have kind of surface memories, uh, particularly in this town, of what happened. Um, but I think people are going to be surprised at how much richer, how much um, more complex, and in many ways, how much more poignant uh, Ford's story is. One very quick thing, beginning, uh, early in my research, I, I'm the first person to find Gerald Ford's baby book. And I was thrilled, you know, and inside, first words, first, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the most poignant thing, I think, in the whole book, it, f Baby's First Auto Ride. Well, guess what? Baby's First Auto Ride came when he was two weeks old, a day after his birth father, who was a scoundrel, uh, walked into the bedroom where his wife and infant son were holding a butcher knife, threatening to kill them both. And Dorothy King, as her name was at the time, a remarkable woman, extraordinary woman, particularly when you think 100 years ago, uh, the position that a, a woman would be in, um, the next day slipped out of the house with her baby uh, and was driven across the bridge from Omaha to Council Bluffs, Iowa, to get a train for Chicago. And basically, you know, leave this man behind. Uh, that was baby's first auto ride. And um, people, I, I, one of the things that people don't know is just how broken the Ford family or the King family was and how it came back 30 years later in um, a court trial that I will leave hanging and let you um, <laughs> discover for yourself. Anyway, first of all, please join me in thanking Brian Lamb. Uh, not, not only for his uh, contributions tonight, but even more for almost 40 years um, of C-SPAN, uh, which is um, pretty extraordinary. <laughs>